Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you're ready to increase your confidence in conversations and conflict, deepen your self-awareness, expand your connectedness, and enrich your relationship with yourself and other humans you care about, and even those you wish you didn't, you're in the right place. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, and I'm so glad that we have an opportunity to talk about this big topic today, which is the topic of trauma. You know, trauma is, seems like such a big word, and you think of things like, oh, the 9-11 or big items like that, but trauma can be small and personal and very individual. And whether or not you're traumatized is not the same as whether someone else is traumatized by the same event. Each person is different. Each person has a different background. And so it's important for us to know that it's normal and it's healthy to react and respond to trauma. We don't want to be so cool that we don't take it in or so unfeeling that we can't get in touch with what the impact of it is for us. Or we pretend that we don't care or it doesn't matter or we're above it or beyond it. Those things are not healthy. They may be in the moment so that you can cope for sure. But if you continue to deny the effect of trauma on you, things can get really bad for you, particularly in the field of the relationship with yourself and relationship with other people. And so it's healthy to pay attention to how you manage that response. So I wanted to talk today about a few things about coping. Because for us to be able to cope with the trauma, not just cope with it in the moment and do what we have to do. You know, if someone dies, we have a lot of grief. But what we naturally tend to do is postpone some of that grief and the working through so that we can manage all of the details about how we're going to celebrate their life and what we're going to do as a celebration of that life. So we get engaged in the day-to-dayness and making sure that all the boxes are ticked. But then it's really wise to take some time to handle it, not just cope with it, but handle it. And so in order to handle it, we want to be clear that you don't allow the past to totally destroy the present. So if you've had a trauma and you, you think about it and you look at it and you say, what's this the similar to in my background? When has this happened to me before? And then we isolate and find that place where it's happened to you before. And then you say, is this new relationship where it's happening again in this new event or circumstance is happening again? Is it the same or is it my read on it that's the same? Because many times I'm working with couples and they've had past difficulties or abuse or trauma in a relationship before. And then when their new partner says something to them or does something, their read of it is the same as it would have been for their old partner. And we have to get back up into the present moment. So we don't want to allow the past to totally destroy the present. And that, that's a, a key for us. You know, we can look back and see where was this in my past and is it similar this time or am I going back into the past and re-wounding, which will happen. You know, I'm not suggesting that you don't feel re-wounded, but I'm suggesting that you look at, is it appropriate for me to feel re-wounded in the context of my new relationship? Okay, that's an important one. So that goes beyond coping to actually managing what's going on emotionally. And then despite your negative emotions at that moment, you you still want to preserve your sense of self-respect and honor your heart and your soul. So it requires self-reflection. You need to spend some time figuring out, oh, what am I really thinking and feeling? And where is this that I am feeling it? And what am I thinking about it? And am I thinking about it in the context, as I just said, of the present time? 
or is this in the context of many past similar events? So when something happens to us in a relationship particularly, whose face do I have on my partner right now? Is it my mother's face or an old boyfriend's face or uh, an ex-wife's face? And now as soon as I hear or see that tone of voice or that look in the face, I immediately go, oh, I know this one. And so I don't engage. I go from my fear. So we need to be wise about trauma in that case. And coping and managing trauma does not mean that we're overcoming or whitewashing the very real losses that trauma can bring. No, we're not sweeping it under the carpet at all. We want to, when our body has settled down a little bit and we've gotten through the worst of it or we've coped with whatever we had to do, to have the wisdom to maybe even go to someone, come to someone like me and let's work it through. Let's talk it through. I don't want it to settle into your body again. I don't want it to become such a part of your memory that it's just ready, waiting there to be triggered again. Let's do some clearing of that and, and finding out exactly what's going on and how we can read that differently if it needs to be read differently. Because that's a gift you give to yourself to say, okay, the world's not doing it to me. I get to decide on the response that I have to whatever happens. That's where my power lies, is I get to respond. You know, there's a wonderful spiritual book, and one of the great lines in it is, I give everything the meaning that it has for me. I give everything the meaning that it has for me. So whatever is going on, I make up what it means. And I want to be in the moment, present, and bring all of my information and learning and all of my decisions about how I want to be, my beliefs, my values, my vision for you today, to the present moment and fit it into that context. So I'm certainly not um, taking away any, any of the impact or lessening the impact or of the, of the trauma that happened. I'm using it as a tool to learn from moving forward. And it was really a good idea to get that help before you respond to it, if you possibly can. Now, that's why it's good to have someone, maybe like me or your favorite therapist or whatever, where you can just have an ongoing relationship where you can drop in and say, hey, I need to talk about this thing. I need, I need a neutral person to, who knows me to help me walk through this and see if I'm thinking clearly. Because when we're in a heightened emotional state, we're not thinking clearly. We can't. You know, when, when we get into the fight or flight mechanism, the first thing that happens is the body goes on high alert and it says, I got to keep this body alive. And so it starts taking blood from all of the extremities to keep the heart and lungs going, to keep that body alive. And you know where it takes it from that doesn't help you one bit? Your head. You know, Ashley Brilliant said this. He said, when you're angry, you will make the best speech you'll ever regret. And that's because you don't have the full capacity of thinking. You have lost some of the blood. It's come down to your body to keep you alive. And the more angry or the more upset or the more anxious that you become, the more you lose the capacity to think. And then you'll speak. And if you speak, you can really get into some difficulties. So it's good to have someone to run that by, you know. I don't want to take anything away from your trauma. I don't want to make little of it. We never forget the trauma. But we don't need to be carrying the impact of it as a felt sense every day. And then being hypervigilant, looking for other people to wound us, using the context of what's happened to us in the past. Does that make sense? Because many people are doing that. They're just a bundle of everything that's happened to them, and they've kind of got their one shoulder to the world going, you're not going to hurt me again, are you? And then everything that looks even similar to it turns out as a hurt. And then I feel belittled or discounted or blamed or hurt again. And I don't have to live like that. I need to come back to equilibrium. So I really want to give you some tips for that today. And so here, here, here are a few things that you can do. Take some steps to deal with the trauma directly and constructively, as opposed to indirectly and destructively. So take 
some steps and get some help if you need to deal with the trauma, that trauma, that particular trauma in that time frame with those people or that person, deal with it constructively and directly. Don't go talking to a whole lot of other people about it or spill your feelings all over the place that are inappropriate and that you have to mop up afterwards. Get some help. Deal with it directly. Get some help to make sense of it. Put it in the context of your life and, and help you use it as a tool to become better at protecting yourself, being safe, and understanding who you are and how you are in the present moment. So that's number one. Take steps to dealing with the trauma directly and constructively. And step number two is to make an effort to confront and try to ease your pain. Now, whether that pain is emotional or physical or spiritual or mental, it's really important that you know that you can keep yourself safe by easing the pain. And again, get help if you need to. But you matter. Don't just suck it up and just move on and pretend it didn't happen. You matter. You were hurt. You felt damaged. You felt diminished, perhaps. Or you had a great loss. Or you're grieving something in that loss. Or you're grieving the loss of something from your childhood. You know, many times I'll work with people, and of course I work with people all over the world, so I know this is true, where they're actually grieving the loss of having a hijackal, you know, that's my term for the relentlessly difficult people in the world, of having a hijackal mother. And the loss can never be retrieved. You didn't have a mom who was loving and nurturing and welcoming. And she, she wasn't excited about your successes unless they made her look really good. And then she was excited about how good she looked as opposed to how well you did. And she wasn't concerned about your emotional well-being. She was concerned about hers. And then you realize that I never had someone who welcomed me with joy in my life, as Dr. Gary Salyer says. You know, we want to be welcomed with joy in our lives. And when we have a hijackal mom, you, you were there because you were an object that other people would come up to her and say, what a beautiful baby. And then she could say, "How you know, I did it. I created this beautiful baby. And then as soon as you start talking and you say no to her, things start to go sideways. So maybe you're grieving what you never had. And that's traumatic sometimes, and it has to be worked through. So make an effort and try to e ease your emotional, physical, spiritual, mental pain. You're, you matter. You really do. And you need to remember that and make yourself a priority. You don't need to go around without getting help or with feeling broken and not know what to do. You know, reach out. Let's talk. So that's number two, make an effort to confront and try and ease the pain. And number three is take some steps in this moment to make your life as fulfilling as possible. Again, you matter. So you want to have a life that is fulfilling and you need to know what would fulfill you. So you've had a loss or a trauma or grief or pain or something's gone completely sideways in your life and it, it represents as trauma or it presents as trauma. And you, you work it through, as we've just said, or I've just said, <laughs> and then you need to say, what would fulfill me? What would fill that empty place? What would make me feel like it's absolutely a wonderful day when I wake up? What could I do that opens my heart and fulfills me? and allows me to live my values. So number three, take steps in the present moment to make your life fulfilling. And number four is begin to accept rather than to deny or fight any limitations that the trauma has imposed on you or that you've allowed it to impose on you. So you need to accept that maybe I haven't worked through this trauma. Maybe this past trauma is limiting me. I'm not engaging in relationships fully. I'm not living fully. I'm not stepping into new things because I'm afraid that the trauma may reoccur. You don't want to live in limitation, do you? You don't want to live in scarcity. So of course the answer is no, I don't want to live in limitation or scarcity. So then you have to begin to accept rather than deny or fight any limitations that trauma 
has imposed on you or you have allowed it to impose on you. And I don't mean allowed it as the you're a bad person and you shouldn't have done that. But when you start to have a look at it and become very aware of it, you realize, oh, this is what I've carried with me. I've allowed myself to carry this with me because I haven't worked it through. And so when we're dealing with these things, these traumas, these losses, whatever, that we have this um, opportunity. It presents as an opportunity, often a painful opportunity. I get that. But it is an opportunity to look at life again and to say, what meaning am I giving to this? And what would I like to do with and about this? That's your opportunity in every moment. Sure, it's going to take a little bit to get through some pain. Do that first. But then come out into the, into the opening. And the more that you do that, the more that you stand up and say, ah, okay, I've taken that in. I know what to do with it. I know what I want. I know what I'm moving toward. That's when you take control of your life. And sure, trauma is a setback, loss is a setback, grief is a setback, but then you need to step forward. And I hope that some of the things that I've said to you today can help and that they do help. And I'm always here for you. So remember, go to fourrelationshiphelp.com and see how we can work together to work through some of the trauma that you may have experienced or maybe experiencing right now in a difficult relationship with a hijackal. I'm Dr. Rue British Taylor. Talk soon. Hello. I'm so excited that you're back. And if you're here for the first time, I hope you'll be coming back. This is Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. And I always bring you the best guests I could possibly find. And today we're going to talk about something we haven't talked much about before. We're going to talk about those troubling things that happen when someone you really didn't want to have leave you left, whether they left because they walked out or because they passed on or for whatever reasons. So I have with me Dr. Sherry Cormier. She's written a new book about this called Sweet Sorrows, Finding Enduring Wholeness After Loss and Grief. And she's a licensed psychologist and a certified bereavement trauma specialist. She's had many issues herself, many losses that those are the people who make the best people to help you. Believe me, when you couple personal experience with professional expertise, you're going to get the best. And I tell my people that all the time, Sherry. So Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I truly believe that. So this book that you've written, and we want to hear about it, combines your psychological expertise and then all that you learned by going through that so that you can help yourself and help other people. So I'm so happy that you're here with me today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm excited that you're here because, as I said, it's a new thing that we haven't talked a lot mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and actually given it the name grief and trauma mm -hmm. because these things can happen to us. I had a friend last week in a perfectly beautiful celebration marriage and mm. just wonderful. And they went out and they went to a big celebration, a, a big festival, and the next day he was dead. And there was no indicators, nothing yes. at all, right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about why this became intriguing to you. <laughs> well, what a great question. <laughs> I've been a psychologist for many years. And so I've always worked with people who've had issues, just like what you just mentioned, that story, or people who've lost a child or spouse or a lot of divorce, which is a loss. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I tell people, I think often going through a divorce is a certain kind of death. Yeah. You know, it's the a death of a relationship. In some ways, it's a sort of part of yourself may die with it. And so I've, I had a lot of experience working with people through therapy, but I didn't have any real personal experience with loss until 10 years ago. And in the last decade, I got hit with so much loss. It was, it was as if 
the universe was just trying to give me lesson after lesson after lesson about how to cope and grow really from loss. So 10 years ago, I was living a pretty charmed life. I had the job of my dreams. I was married to the man of my dreams. We had just built a new house. We had great plans for the future. My husband was very healthy. And one day, almost out of the blue, he got diagnosed with stage four terminal inoperable cancer. Mm. He died six months after the diagnosis, but three months before he died, my beloved father died. So within three months, I lost both my father and my husband, the two most important men in my life. Yes. And I was really jolted to say the least. Maybe mm. that's an understatement. I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple of years after that, I lost my mother. And then after my father and husband died, I had rescued a dog sort of to help me with companionship needs. I think pets are wonderful, you know, for grief and loss healing. Highly recommend it. Then the dog developed a brain tumor and she died. <laughs> and then last year, my only sibling and sis who was a sister died. Oh, my. So, yeah. So I've become very acquainted. And then in the, in the meantime, I felt like my work was shifting. As, as you said, really in the beginning, I felt much more equipped to talk with people about how loss smacks you in the face, mm -hmm. upside and down and turns you all around. And I became a bereavement trauma specialist. And now I work pretty exclusively with um, bereavement. Hmm. Is that hard to do? Because, you know, I work with a very specialized population and people ask me that mm. question all the time. Um, do you find it difficult to do or is this mm -hmm. your passion? What this is, is really my calling. This mm -hmm. is really my calling. So I don't find it difficult. I and, and I feel like in the last 10 years, no matter where I've been, I could be on an airplane and invariably. I get the seat next to someone who is going to a funeral or been to a funeral or someone just, uh, I mean, it, it, it just keeps happening. Mm -hmm. So this is really my calling and it doesn't feel draining at all. You know, it's interesting. I, I expected that to be your answer, but I mm -hmm. didn't want to conclude that it would be, but mm -hmm. you know, I always say that doing the work that I do is what floats my boat and flips my skirt and gets me up in the morning. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I, I love have, that expression. <laughs> and I, I have colleagues who say, oh, how can you do that? Work with that you know, difficult. Hour after hour. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> and I think, oh, no. You know, if you have lived this, mm -hmm. you understand the value of it. You understand all the feelings. You understand that, mm -hmm. you know, A to Z, what's going on. You can say things that will move people forward yes. faster. Um it, it's a joy that came from ruin in a sense. Yes. Right. It is a joy that came from ruin. That's a great way to put it. And I think also there's so much um, almost validation because you have lived through it. And so you know that what you are saying is perceived as so helpful and so useful Mm -hmm. that that's very rewarding. That's a very rewarding kind of work, I think. I think so too. And, and you know, that, that's, as I say, what gets you up in the morning is wanting to help because you know you have something that yes. is helpful. Yes. And a person can go and read all the books. Like in my work with people who are in relationship with mm -hmm. these people that I trademark the term hijackles for. Yes. The people with the patterns, traits, and cycles. And, they could go and they can read all they want on the internet. But what it does, usually aside from recognition, is it causes some distancing because they don't see themselves as part of the relationship still. They kind of shut yes. the door and say, oh, well, that's that other person's issue. Yes. Well, it isn't. It is. Yes. It's a dynamic situation in which you mm -hmm. have to stay 
a participant. Yes. And the thing with grief is, you know, of course we go through time where we just want to get into bed and pull the covers over our heads. Yes, we do. But then there are stages and I think one person's trauma or one person's grief is not another's. There's no right way to do it, is there? Absolutely. You know, just today I read something by a trauma specialist and she said, what might be traumatic for me may be just a little stressor for someone else. What might be a little stressor for someone else might be traumatic for me. So we do have to be careful not to make assumptions that, that are egocentric, you know, how I view trauma or what's been traumatic for me is necessarily traumatic for everyone else or, or, you know, in the work that you do the same sort of thing. Yes. Well, and I think the eradication of the word should is very important there. You know, Mm -hmm. you should get out of bed. You should get on with it. You should do these things or you shouldn't Mm -hmm. feel like that anymore. And, you know, after Mm -hmm. all, it's been four weeks. I mean, every (laughs) time, (laughs) <laughs> somebody is really saying, in my opinion, what someone is saying when they do that is, I don't know what to say to you and I don't know how to deal with you. So straighten up. Really, because they I'm, are. That I'm, is really what is happening. Absolutely. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> so they're saying, I'm really uncomfortable with where you yes. are right now. So get they're, normal. Would you? <laughs> right. They're saying, please get normal for me. Yes. Never yes. mind what you're going through. I'm just so uncomfortable with this. So please get normal for me. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, I I want everybody listening to know that what we're saying is you may have well-meaning friends who just don't know what to do. They Mm -hmm. don't know what to say and they Mm -hmm. might make a few mistakes. And on the other side, you may not know how to communicate what's going on with you and you may make them feel like you don't want to talk to them and they feel left out. There's going to be mistakes made because this is really difficult terrain. This is difficult terrain. And particularly I think in the United States, I think in the United States, we are more grief phobic Mm -hmm. than many other cultures, you know, in, in uh, some of the Spanish speaking cultures, they, they celebrate, celebrate, Um, a day of the dead. There's many other countries that have great rituals Mm -hmm. around death and dying. We don't do that so much. And I do have a chapter in Sweet Sorrow about what do you say and do for your friends and family? Oh, good. Suffering. Because I think we are all quite awkward around people who've lost something or someone precious and we don't know what to say and sometimes we see them coming in the grocery store and we think oh I'll go hide in the uh, soda aisle or I'll go hide in the produce section because our discomfort is really real Mm -hmm. so that's such an important point that you make and I always say to people you know if one of your friends or even a client i mean i'm much better now than i was before i experienced loss right but it's so easy to put foot in mouth and i think there are a couple of phrases that are really difficult i think saying to someone this was god's will or there's a reason for this those are fairly offensive kinds of remarks to hear when you've just lost uh, a relationship or a person or a house to a wildfire, for example. And I also think saying, I know exactly how you feel can be offensive because we really don't know exactly how the other person feels. And so inviting the person to talk with us and saying that we'd like to listen and inviting them to tell their story of loss and acknowledging is so important. I think just acknowledging, you know, saying, I know that you, uh, your husband just died yesterday and I'm so sorry to hear that. And I'm wondering what this feels like for you and what could I do to be helpful? Right. Yes. And I, I've been involved in a little bit here in San Diego with the death cafes. I don't know if you're familiar with them. 
And one of my friends is the person who started them here. And she says the, the phrase that she finds offensive and hopes nobody uses is the one you most often see on social media. And it says, so sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. And she feels that that is a dismissive statement that mm -hmm. you should be more engaging with someone. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right. People are going to go to the soda and the produce aisle when they're uncomfortable, <laughs> yes. right? Like, I don't know how to fix it. I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm out of here. And you know, your very presence can make a difference. You may yeah. not know what to say. You might say, as you said, I know your husband died recently. I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what to say, but I definitely am willing to talk with you about it. Yes. And that to me is maybe the most authentic thing you could say. And I even like to say to people, if you feel awkward and you don't really know what to say, just say that, yeah. say, just say that and be available. Sometimes a hug, if you know the person well, of course, a hug is really well received. And, you know, we do know that um, being in a safe space with another person when we're feeling grief-stricken and bereaved is, is really good for our brains because it helps us release oxytocin, mm -hmm. which is a feel-good hormone, and it decreases cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And we know that oxytocin, the release of that is really an, an immediate antidote for those raging stress hormones like cortisol. So, you know, being able to really be present to someone who's suffering from loss and give them a, a hug or look them in the eye, touch them on the shoulder, you know, just say, I'm, I'd like to like to talk with you about this. I'm, you know, know that your husband did die and I'm not sure exactly what you might need. I'd love to listen and, and hear from you how I can help. Mm -hmm. And what I hear you saying, Sherry, is just be authentic and real yes. and present. Yes. You don't have to get fancy. There's no right. No. <laughs> so I want to switch this a little because we only have a half hour to talk. I want to get into a little piece that, that I think really needs addressing uh, because of the crossover of the grief and loss and trauma mm -hmm. that, with, that we both deal with in our practices. Mm -hmm. So we can help people with the idea of the loss is not just that something ended. And you brought it up a little bit when you were speaking earlier. It's mm -hmm. that the whole projected future of the yes. relationship or the marriage or our retirement years, if it was someone passing on, um, that whole projection, that whole trajectory mm. is gone. Yes. You've hit on a huge thing because, you know, whether it's, Losing a house to a wildfire, losing a job, losing a relationship to divorce, losing someone to death. We not only lose that thing or that person, we lose our hopes and yeah. dreams, our plans, mm -hmm. our plans that we had constructed for the future. That's gone too. That's out the window. Mm-hmm. So it's almost a double whammy, I think. Oh, I absolutely think so. Um, because everything becomes related to I'm going to do that or in two years I'm going mm -hmm. to do that or, you know, we were going to be at our daughter's graduation together. Yes. Now we're yes. not. All, all the things that when you brought that baby home from the hospital and you foresaw yes. coming down the stairs for their prom or whatever, and, you know, whatever is going on, you have all those dreams and photographs mm -hmm. already taken in your head. And yes. then they go dark. They are not yes. going to happen. Yes. And whether or not you're leaving a hijackal, you know, these difficult people I talk about, mm -hmm. um, or someone has actually left the planet, it's the same thing. Like yes. the history changes. Yes. Well, that's incorrect. The history is there, but the future projection is gone. It may yes. be on a different trajectory if it's a divorce, mm -hmm. but all of those hooked in memories of how it was going to be mm -hmm. are not there anymore. 
They're not. And that is, you know, you know, it's so you're doubly grieving the loss of the relationship or the person and the dreams that you had for the future. And it becomes really hard because I think we, be, we get so attached to permanence and we get so attached to forever. And as Eckhart Tolle said, you know, really the only moment we have is now. Mm -hmm. And Pima Chodron, who writes so brilliantly about, you know, every moment we are always changing. I just read where every seven to 10 years, the cells in our body completely turn over. Actually, they do it in one year, except for very few. Two. And then the, those take longer. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're in constant states of impermanence. And yet in our relationships, because we have these attachment bonds, doesn't it seem to you that we don't think about impermanence? When we say I do, it's you know, forever. <laughs> it's forever <laughs> until it's not. And then we get smacked in the face. Well, you brought up something that I wanted to ask you. I think particularly in my population, when when a person has decided to leave a hijackal parent or a hijackal partner, um, <clears throat> more so those two relationships than the ones at work or whatever, um, do you think it affects them much more deeply, and I know what your answer is, but I'll put it this way, much more deeply if they never had a secure attachment of any kind in their life previously? I do, and I think that's true if you lose someone to death that I think that what I have found out from the trauma research is that if you have early childhood trauma and you haven't resolved it, mm -hmm. you haven't worked with it, you haven't processed it, then when you're an adult and you get hit with leaving a hijackle, either a parent or a, 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 a spouse or partner uh, or someone dies, then I think your sense of abandonment, of loss, of grief, of bereavement over whatever that is, is much harder to manage. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Yeah, and, but my answer didn't surprise you, I bet. <laughs> no, but you know, it's always good to have validation from someone I respect. You know, I I think that it's it's so much more difficult if you've been the child of a hijackal, so you don't have secure attachment. Right. And then you you will go on, as I've written in my books, you will go on and you will probably marry a hijackal because that's what you're comfortably uncomfortable that's with. A pattern. Yeah. And then maybe when somewhere in your late 30s, early 40s, when you wake up and you have children and a mortgage and all those things and you go, hey, you know, this is not so good here. Right. <laughs> right. Um, this doesn't feel so good. <laughs> no. You know, maybe it's not me because a hijack will always tell you everything is your fault. Yes. So you wake up and you say, maybe it's not me. Mm -hmm. And yet you've not had secure attachment because you didn't have a good bond with the parent because yes. of their hijackal nature. And now you, you kind of in the, well, I've got this one. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, I should just hang in there. And mm -hmm. because I don't know that I deserve to be treated well with respect, yes. right? Right. I, I don't have it in me. I haven't gotten inculcated, inculcated in me the I am worthy piece. Mm -hmm. So I don't, if I had the I am worthy, there would be no question. But when I don't have the I am worthy, then I, you know, I'm living with that insecurity and also probably really not being able to trust what my life would be like if I leave the hijackal partner or mm -hmm. spouse. I don't really know. I mean, sort of, you almost don't have that trust and confidence in yourself to know that you can really make it on your own, except that there is a phenomenon now that we're seeing in, in people who go through seismic catastrophic events that we call post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more about that. And what we know about that is that this, this is actually a pretty new psychological phenomenon. It, it was re it's only been researched in about the last 20 years, which in psychology is really quite new. And it's been researched by two men at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, um, John Tedeschi and 
Lawrence Calhoun, Tedeschi and Calhoun. I, actually, I think it's Richard. I keep wanting to call him John, but it's Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun. And they wanted to research wise people, people with wisdom. And so they started interviewing people who survived a serious injury and became paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And then they looked at uh, elderly people who had lost their partner or spouse. And then since then, they've also looked at people and interviewed people who've gone through uh, losing houses to wildfires and disasters and floods and terrorism and violence. And they found some very consistent patterns. So one of the things they're finding is that, you know, you can go through this, this event that to you feels seismic, like on the volcano scale, seismic. And everyone says, I wouldn't have chosen for this. I wouldn't have chosen for my marriage to have ended in divorce or for my partner to have died or to have lost my house. And yet it's made me over time. And I want to stress that over time, it's made me a stronger, more resilient, better person, more able to handle things that I couldn't handle. I have better self care practices. Now I have a different philosophy of life. Now I see life more positively. Now um, I have a deeper sense of spirituality now that I feel really connected to. Mm -hmm. So they started seeing all of these patterns and many, many people, not everybody, but many people who go through a very catastrophic event. And, and I want to sort of stress that we really don't see that much post-traumatic growth if it's sort of an upsetting event, but if it really is something that shakes you to the core mm -hmm. and it really challenges your fundamental assumptions about life and your worldview and about people and about yourself, that seems to set the stage over time for post-traumatic growth to emerge. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, I'm sure that there's a lot in the research when we, we just put it so simply in these terms, but it makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. I know people who have recovered from incredible injuries yes. because they were willing to do what it took. Yes. They were willing to exercise. They were willing yes. to have a little pain. They were willing to walk through some extra pain. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, they would do things. And yet mm -hmm. I know other people who went, oh, well. Who know. crumpled. Yeah. Other people like, just crumpled. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that word resilience is really yes. worth exploring because what is it? What is the key thing that makes the difference between the crumpler and the one who actually overcomes. What do you think it is? Well, I don't really know if we exactly have the, an the empirical answer to that, but I will say that I do believe that if you can find meaning, I think that might be the trigger. I think people who grow from a seismic or catastrophic event versus those who don't, first of all, are people who are able to find some kind of meaning. Mm -hmm. And we can go back to the Holocaust. You know, we know people who survived uh, prison camps and, and survived the Holocaust. And how did they do it? They found meaning in the internment and in the prison and in the abuse that they endured um, and all of that. Sure. So, well, I think the, finding meaning. Yeah, man's search for meaning. I mean, Victor we, Frankel, right? Yeah. I mean, we've got we've got that, and you know, we don't have to go through the Holocaust, but it might feel like the Holocaust. But it might, yeah. yes, it could feel it. You know, and again, what might feel like a Holocaust to me might be different for you. Yeah, and, and it's another one of those things that, that we don't want to be saying to somebody. Well, you know, you're going to get through this. You'll be so much better on the other side. Right. Like, oh, there's diminishing trauma. <laughs> you know, 
Three days after my beloved husband died, a woman said to me, oh, Sherry, don't worry. You will be just fine. And I, 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 I couldn't believe my ears because I didn't feel fine. And I didn't know how she knew I would be just fine. And I really wasn't just fine for a, a, a while. So, yes, that is not a great thing to say. But I think finding meaning does help us go to resilience. And I think we can then plant what I like to call seeds of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I think the first, probably the most important seed of resilience that we can do for um, post-traumatic growth is the practice of medic some kind of meditation or mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So something like mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is John Kabat-Zinn. Mm -hmm. There are many apps. I have an app on my phone called Calm. Mm -hmm. There's a, an app, another app I use called Headspace. So there's many apps we can use for mindfulness. Mindfulness really changes the brain. It calms our emotional brain. You know, it makes us happier. We feel more peaceful. Um, it's great for rumination and worry. And having been sort of a former warrior, I can really attest mm -hmm. to the value of daily meditation. Yeah. So I think meditation is great. Social support is so important. You know, one of the things that happens, I think, around grief is grief can be very isolating. Oh, very. For, for some of the reasons we just said, you know. Mm -hmm people can want to avoid you because they don't know what to say. So, and plus you've lost, you know, your parent or your partner, if it's a hijackle and you've separated from that relationship or if someone's died. So you can feel really alone and really isolated. And we know now that sadness, the healing of sadness, whether it's from death or leaving a hijackle is healed most by the quality and quantity of the, of our connections with other people. Mm -hmm. So that's so important. No, I, would, I certainly agree. I just don't want to go too far without making a comment about those things, yes. because one of the things that happens so many times is I have Facebook groups where people interact with me about life with a hijackle. Yes. And, and they will say, you know, stop me, stop me. I've been no contact for four months and I want to call him or her so mm -hmm. badly. Mm -hmm. What can I do? Well, it's what you were just saying. You know, it's that patterning, like they're, mm -hmm. they're reaching out for social support. Mm -hmm. But also it's like that was their go-to person, healthier. Yes. Not. That was their go-to person. That was their idealized person. Yes. And in the case of a hijackal, it, it, they always believe that if they enable and condone their bad behaviors, that somehow they're magically going to become wonderful people. Doesn't yeah. happen, folks. Don't no, go there. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is that we get, we get hooked on that. And then when we feel this isolation and marginalization, because people don't stick around for very long after the funeral, do they? Or mm -hmm. after the breakup, like it's all, oh, yeah. everybody comes around and then all of a sudden it's like, Quick, and then back? disappear, people disappear. Yeah. yeah. And that's when you have to really worry. I mean, I don't think people, whether it's because they left a relationship with a hijackle or someone died, the worrisome part is not in the immediate aftermath. It's a little bit later when people get back to their own lives and get busy and then you are then left alone. And I think you hit on something else that, you know, there's almost a little bit of, you know, an addiction. Like I've got to call that person. I've got to call that person because that person had been their go-to person. Right. Um, but not a not a great thing to do, to be doing so no it isn't and and you've just given so much so i just want to tell everybody before i ask you a final question okay. that i've been talking with dr sherry cormier and you're going to want to read her book it's called sweet sorrow and the subtitle is finding enduring wholeness after loss and grief now you can see she's got a world of information for you she's really thought this through as well as lived it through and so you want to be doing that so go to sherry and that's s-h-e-r-r-y cormier c-o-r-m-i-e-r author.com 
sherrycormierauthor.com to find that book. And I'm sure it's on Amazon as well. And you can go and find it. All your major booksellers. Yes. (laughs) So you'll find that book, Sweet Sorrow. Popular phrase, you can remember that. Sweet Sorrow. And such in an oxymoron. (laughs) So (laughs) such a good title. So we've got much more that we could talk about. And often when I have a really intriguing guest like you, Sherry, I ask you to come back in three weeks. I'd love to come back. I would love it. about it some more. So if you had one piece of advice to give to someone who's just had a major loss, no matter how that loss occurred, what would you say to them as the most wise thing that you could say? Well, I would say trust the process, take time to heal, And remember that loss, as difficult as it feels right now for you, and it might feel pretty difficult, eventually loss can be a great catalyst for growth and awakening. Beautiful. So, So, you know, Sherry very carefully said, it may not feel anything like that right now. It may be unthinkable that you will even get through the chasm you feel you're sitting at the bottom of the abyss Uh, but she's speaking from experience she's had many losses she's done the research she's helped other people so when she says that you can believe her thanks so much for being my guest Sherry thank you so much I so enjoyed it thank Thank you. you my guest Dr. Sherry Cormier a licensed psychologist and professor Emerita in the Department of Counseling, Rehabilitation Counseling, and Counseling Psychology at West Virginia University. She also has a private practice. So you can tell that if you're in some place, some dark place where you're feeling like you've been left behind by a person or a relationship or whatever, there are things you can do. So make sure to contact her, SherryCormierAuthor.com. Buy her book on Amazon, Sweet Sorrow. And if you want to talk to me, you'll always find me at 4relationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com. Go to my YouTube channel. Guess what? Same name, 4 Relationship Help. And tell your friends if you enjoyed this podcast today and invite them to come along or listen to all the back issues. And I'll look forward to seeing you right here again soon. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting 4relationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy.